I, I, I woke up one morning, I got a telephone call uh, from my twin brother. And he said that uh, our older brother had made uh, a, 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 an attempt on his own life. Welcome back to another episode of George on Sports with me, your host, George. And as part of Mental Health Awareness Week, I'm glad to be joined by Mark Rowland, Chief Executive of the Mental Health Foundation. Mark, I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to join me today. How are you? Really great. Thanks, George. Great to be with you uh, on a sunny Friday afternoon and to sort of close off Mental Health Awareness Week speaking with you. So that's fantastic. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited that you agreed to do this. Uh, mental health is something that I care about quite deeply, I don't know, as I know many people do, including yourself. Um, and I want to kickstart by talking about mental health as a whole topic of conversation, because it appears to me that some people, some people don't seem to understand what mental health actually is. Um, hmm. You know, sometimes the term can be thrown around and used in the wrong ways. So if you could, based on your experiences and, and, and your work that you do with the great um, Mental Health Foundation, what exactly is mental health? And what are some of the common misconceptions that you have come across um, in your time within the topic? Wow, that's a big question. And it's a great question, actually. And thank you very much for asking it. And listen, you know, I think mental health as a, a, an area is contested and there isn't a sort of single definition that everyone agrees on. So different people have different perspectives. Uh, we define it as effectively the quality of your inner life. It's like how much distress are you experiencing at any one moment is and that that can shift along a spectrum from, you know, feeling great to really feeling terrible. Now, the 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 and and, and so the idea is that for us. Um, normal emotions that we experience that can be both positive and negative, that is really healthy. It's good to, to feel the range of human emotions that we have, but we all have a, um, uh, a vulnerability to those feelings um, getting stuck, getting complicated and preventing us from living our life and fulfilling our potential. And that's our definition of mental ill health, really. It's the, uh, it's the way in which our personality, trauma and environment mm -hmm. mix together to mean that our inner and emotional life becomes something that disables us from being able to fulfill our, our key potential. And that's kind of echoed within the what the World Health mm -hmm. Organization defines as good mental health, which is our ability to be able to play our full part in our families, in our jobs and in our communities. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned something in your explanation there, which resonated with me and I believe resonated with yourself too. You use the word trauma. Can you share a bit about your personal experience with and your personal journey with mental health and how that has shaped your work? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, my my work started off, I, I was raised in Central Africa. So I was raised in a country called Rwanda, um, which collectively probably had one of the biggest traumas of uh, of, of of the 20th century um, back in 1994, mm. uh, where, oh, you know, you, you had 800,000 people who were killed in, in just 100 days. Um, yeah. So. I wasn't involved with that. I had left the country by the time that had happened, but I knew many friends of family that had died, and so I touched on it. And uh, I then went on to work in kind of the area of poverty alleviation and international development, trying to address um, the the sort of physical needs that people had. And um, you know, I think that was going to be my life's work until um, we. I, I woke up one morning, I got a telephone call uh, from my twin brother and he said that uh, our older brother had made uh, a, 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 an attempt on his own life mm. and he was in hospital and he didn't know whether they were going to make it through. And I remember that moment. And I think trauma can be defined as as those uh, those moments where your inner life suddenly shatters. It's like yep. a it's like a glass going off and everything before and after feels different. And that was one of those moments. And um, my brother 
went into hospital, um, but he he didn't recover and he died two or three days later. Uh, and so for us and for our family, that was a direct hit on the understanding that what the worst case scenario is when our our inner life, our mental health deteriorates to the point where we just can't tolerate mm. the inner turmoil. We'd rather it switched off. And my brother always, he used this term, which at the time I I didn't really know what it meant, but he he used to talk about um, luxuriating in the idea of oblivion, like it was just, mm -hmm. uh, it felt to him like such a relief because he hadn't found the ways, he hadn't found the tools to be yeah. able to relieve that inner turmoil in a way that enabled him to 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 uh, want to live. And, mm -hmm. you know, we know that there are so many things you can do, so many ways in which you can recover and you can learn to manage uh, those persistent and really difficult emotions. But that, I guess, George, was my, you know, it was it was a very traumatic experience and one in which... Absolutely. Um, you know, you're still putting together those that sort of shattered in life. Yeah, it's like if you imagine a mm. mirror smashing on the floor, that's what happens inside yep. of you, and that's what happens when people go through those kind of events. And and um, you know, yeah, it's be it, it will be common for for many for many people. Um, yeah, how how to recover, and we can talk a little bit um, yep. about that. First and foremost, my condolences, Mark. I know that couldn't have been easy. Um, and I'm, I'm keen to, to ask, that ex having gone through that, that trauma um, and the experience of, of that trauma and that situation, has that changed or did it change your perspective on mental health? Or were you already, did you, had you already experienced a number of things and had, had you know, a well-defined opinion of mental health? I'm wondering if that, if that had any effect. Yeah, I know. I was probably like most people. I I, I came from a perspective of of um, slightly being afraid of the idea of mental illness. Um, seen it in a couple of people. Would have seen mental illness as um, more like a like a disease, like cancer that mm -hmm. you get, and there's really not much. There's kind of, and I would see, it, and I would have seen it like something malfunctioning in your brain like there's some people who don't have mental illness whose brains function absolutely perfectly and then there are people over here who have mental illnesses who's mm -hmm. and actually what so i was just scared of maybe i was one of those people and who and and my brother had that view of his own depression he viewed it as if his his he had like a san andreas fault which in which almost crippled his ability to think positive thoughts but what we actually mm -hmm. have seen is that that actually our mental health is on on a spectrum and it's actually really difficult there isn't a really clear dividing line between mental illness and, and mental health it does fluctuate mm -hmm. there is a point yeah. at which you do need support you do it crosses over into the diagnostic threshold of, of illness and he was definitely in that but actually what's most important for us is to be able to trace the roots of our distress that we're experiencing today so it's Absolutely. much more important to us not what is wrong with me but what has happened to me and actually if my brother could have traced the fact that maybe the fact that he was relentlessly bullied as a as at school and maybe the fact that even transitioning from our background in africa and coming into the uk maybe his experience um in 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 even as early as 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 having uh, some some uh, trauma at childbirth when he was born those things mm. affect you and he could have potentially seen given him a some given him a different perspective to say it's not all about uh, me and um i think with suicide in particular there is what they call social defeat. It's like I, I have internalized all of these bad feelings and they are about me and they're my fault. And it's just mm. too much to bear. And then yeah. you, you reach for a solution. You reach for what we say is like a, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, before I come to your point of, of, of living in Africa and um, living and working in Africa and Asia, because I'm keen to explore that, that part of your life, you mentioned something there which resonates with my personal story, actually. Something I've not actually yet told on any of my shows or any of my podcasts, and some people may and may not know, but you mentioned cancer, um, and we know how dangerous and um, unforgiving cancer is. I actually lost my mum last year to cancer. Um, in August and it was horrifying to say the least I mean the mm. way you define you know the glass smashing is exactly what mm. happened um, mm. it was something I had never thought I'd never experienced loss in my immediate family or my extended family I'm, I'm 32 mm. years old and mm. it's the first time I've had to deal with anything like that um, and we'd seen it coming for a while I suppose things kind of improved and then you know how cancer can be it kind of takes a turn for the worst mm. um, and it's a very, very strange and I almost want to say inhumane or just unhuman feeling to to physically watch someone pass away. It's let alone my own mm. mother who, mm. yeah, I mean, I'm from Nigerian heritage. My parents came over here so many years ago. I was born here as well as myself and my siblings. And to, to, to when I look back at everything that she'd gone through and, and the fight that she kind of put up and then to, to, to then catch cancer if you like or mm. to get cancer in such a unforgiving way um mm. and then to sort of see anyone who's experienced this will know i mean that life kind of whittles away bit by bit mm. um and it was yeah i mean it's a year in, in august it's, it's something that i i mean i was there we were all there till the very last breath if you like and um I always thought I was, I mean, I, I have my own childhood trauma, which I only just, I only realized some years ago once I started going to therapy and mm. realized how much my childhood and everything that I've been through really shaped mm. who I am today and some of the mm. things that I do and why I do it and how I handle situations, why I may not be as emotional, why I may not be as emotional mm. with other people and things along that line. Mm. But I mean, mm. I talk about a, a mirror being, a glass being smashed. It's, it's, the, it's the perfect analogy because... Mm. There are no words to describe that loss, that sense of someone no longer just being there. I mean, I have kids mm. as well, and so they they kind of know the situation, and it's 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 something that honestly I would never wish on anyone. And mm. talking about mental health, it really does take a massive toll. So mm. Um, mm. I wanted to share my my story as mm. well. I mean, years ago, it's it's probably something I never would have done it had I experienced something like that because I just was never of the opinion that. I mean, I've never. I'm that guy, I've never really spoken out. I mean, like I said, apart from having some therapy some years ago, which I I still still have every now and again now, had mm. I not done any of that, I probably mm. would have still been the same way. I never spoke to anyone when mm. I was a kid. I never, mm. it was part mm. of my culture, I suppose. Mm. You know, if you had an issue, you mentioned coming growing up in Africa, like I, I may have grown up here, but still with African traditions and, 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 and culture, and speaking out was never really a thing. So I just dealt with yeah. everything on my own internalize yeah. everything on my own so when that happened it was mm. you know a massive blow mm. to the point where i would mm. just much rather stay silent and not say anything mm. but um yeah i wanted mm. to shed some light I'm on so, that because well let, let me offer my condolences and thank you very much for for sharing that and um you know blessings to your your mother who it sounds you know the flip side of what you were saying george is that uh is an incredibly loving picture of how you walked together through the final chapter of mm. her life. And I think um, that sounds uh, incredibly, not everybody has that. And I think that speaks to the relationship you obviously had for each other, which is makes the pain harder to bear, mm -hmm. but it's yeah. a pain yeah. that is born out of the love that you have. And um, that's, that's, that's the sort of price you pay for, yeah. for the love that you had. And, 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 you know, I, I, I think, um, I would always choose uh, the loss from love than 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 the uh, the lack of the love in the first place. But um, yeah, it's, it, that doesn't make Thank it you. easy to bear. No, um, and I wanted to ask you also, living and working in Africa and Asia, did you notice any particular differences in the way mental health was both both perceived and treated as in comparison mm. to here in the UK? Mm. It, it's it's difficult to to compare to be honest because different languages and different cultures uh, mm -hmm. are, it was it was certainly my experience working in Asia I was working 
in refugee camps. Uh, we were working with a lot of displaced communities inside war zones in places like, well, in, in, in Myanmar, uh, formerly known as Burma. Um, and then in, in Rwanda, um, I was very young, but we were first, um, we were the only um, white Mzungu at the, at the local school. Um, mm. And so I think my, my experiences on, I was going to say a couple of reflections. In Africa, where there is a very big emphasis on collective and communal living, and mm -hmm. um, that is a protective factor. So there is a much less individualized sense of you're on your own. And there is something about Western culture which makes it, uh, there's a lot of psychological jeopardy because it's all on you, you know. Yeah. It's yeah. like kind of if I don't get this, then, you know, if I fail, it's all on you. And you have also, if I succeed, there's this slightly inflated sense that you're special as well. And actually, you can see that that's not really helpful for a grounded sense of ongoing good mental health because you're only as good as your last gig. Um, yep. And um, so there isn't, there wasn't, as, there isn't as much of a competitive uh, in, experience in, in the communities that I grew up with. And I think that was protective. Having said that, in a lot of very close communities, it's harder to be different. And if your experience is outside of the norm, that was, that, that was, you know, in our yep. culture, we have a bit more space for, mm. um, for the diversity of human experiences. So, um you know it, it certainly was com complicated and others can speak better about the relationship um but you know there was no there really was no coverage of support we had there in rwanda there was maybe one or two psychiatrists for an entire mm. for an entire country so you know yeah. but it's something that is growing in 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 awareness and and has a sort of complicated relationship also with religious tradition and thought and the role of um you, you know and, and how mental health is seen and was you know um so i yeah. think um like every culture there is um some things that were really supportive of mental health but also some things that there were a lot of misunderstandings and myths especially related to let's say ideas around uh, demonic oppression which were mm -hmm. quite often um experiences of um psychotic episodes and, th and those yeah. two things being confused was was quite quite is quite difficult that that, that happens in a lot of religious communities and that just happened mm -hmm. to be the one that i was um quite closely connected to when we were when we were living in Africa so yeah. um but I'd say across the board um there is you know a much greater understanding that um that our that our mental health is is a big part of our life and 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 needs to be protected and and supported and there were some incredibly um brave pioneers as in any uh, social movement who were prepared mm -hmm. to speak openly before um, before others were um, before it became socially acceptable and that's that's happening both in Asia and, yeah. and in Africa now right um, the mental health foundation itself what would you say are some of the some of the core missions um, or core foundations and key initiatives of the foundation yeah, I mean, the foundation has been around since 1949. So it's been around mm. a long time. Um, and I've been working there since 2016. And the, the core focus for us, George, is around um, recognising the this this idea that we are never going to solve a mental health crisis by expanding mental health services alone. You know, we need really effective support, but we need much better preventative um, support. Yeah processes in in mind we need sports coaches religious leaders school teachers work bosses to understand what they need to know and their role in helping to support and protect men, and mental health um parents of course have a, have a massive role so part of our job is we we do four different things but one of the things that we do is work with particular communities at risk people with long-term conditions, refugees and asylum seekers, disadvantaged young young people in schools and communities. And we try to work with them to, to put in interventions that support and protect mental health before there is a diagnosable issue. Yeah. And, and we want to be able yeah. to share that evidence to be able to create good mental health. Um, and so we've got a real, we've got a real vision that, um, 
we, we, we're not just after the absence of ill health or the absence of distress. We want to be able to give people the tools and the confidence to be able to live with, with good mental health. And that means really spending less time, you know, that means being able to experience all those emotions that we talked about, yeah. fear, fear, frustration, sadness, loss, uh, joy, peace, being able to experience all of that, but also in a contained way so that it doesn't overwhelm you. Mm -hmm. You can experience it, right. you can notice it, and you can manage it. You're still driving the car. They're not driving the car, but you're able to be able to feel all of those things in their rightful place and manage that mm. appropriately. And, and that's a really, that's a life's work to be able to help people equip them to do that. But we're saying, go for that, you know, yeah. commit to learn, go on that journey, learn those tools for you and, and see where we can get to, because, um, you know, it's just too important to, to waste, you know, waste our lives with distress mm -hmm. that actually could, could have been avoided. Yeah. yeah. And, and to have not experienced more joy, more peace, more connection, more meaning, more mm. contribution. Who doesn't want that? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned something earlier in your conversation about the types of people that we need, religious leaders, teachers, parents, mm. which leads me to ask about how much does advocacy play a role um, in your work? Because it's always great to see when people, especially in the public eye, open up about their own struggles. Um, in football, for example, the Premier League, there's, they have a whole campaign where you know, some of these, these are, these are footballers that everybody looks up to, kids in particular, and they're seeing them come out and tell their stories about how they've struggled and they then feel better for speaking out and going through their mm. own battles. So how much does advocacy play in, in the role of your work? Yeah, you know, it, it, it plays a massive role. You know, we, we, do, um, we do four things. We do a lot of research. We do a lot of work in communities with at-risk that I talked about, with at-risk groups. We do a lot of public awareness, but we also do a lot of advocacy and they go together. Those four things go together. And I was in Parliament this week and we had we had 50 parliamentarians from across every single political party, minister, four, four government ministers. And I think we had 14 shadow ministers. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, trying to get the, the point in about what they can do outside of health. So how, you know, how the Department for Work and Pensions could actually support mental health in the benefit system how uh, the uh, Department of Culture, Media and Sport can actually help promote and, and support mental health. So there's loads, there's loads we, we do on, on the advocacy front. And, and part of that is connecting the work we do in communities. And we brought with us into Parliament one of the coaches that we work with in, um, in, in Queen's Park Rangers, actually. And we, one of the programmes we do is work oh. with sports coaches to do trauma-informed um, coaching for the coaches so that they can understand where where and how trauma crops up with young people yeah. what they can do to respond what their responsibility is and isn't and so we we're doing that with the premier league and with with also championship clubs as well and mm -hmm. it's so exciting to see the appetite that we, in fact at um, on the match of the day uh this saturday this coming saturday um, they will have a, a short segment on our work with Premier League clubs. And, and it's really exciting to see how they get it. They get That's it. Great. They get that, yeah. that their working community is basically all about uh, supporting young kids' mental health and emotional literacy. And um, there's just so much, there's so much to do. And, um, and yeah, one, one of the things that's important, George, is that there are, a few, there are now a few voices saying we've had a, enough talk about mental health already. Mm. We need to move on. You know, we, mm. we, we are talking about other things or, or, or we, we're, we're creating a problem. And we, we, we really don't believe that. We think that um, there are still many people who are experiencing uh, distress and mental ill health who don't have the confidence to share it and don't have anyone to talk to. Uh, yeah. and, um, and we, we, we and particularly men. Um, and yeah. there are, uh, so we, we, we think we, we want, we want to be able to continue to to reach beyond the people who are already having these conversations to be able to reach mm -hmm. further and, and encourage uh, more vulnerability, just more ability to express how you feel. You know, it's yeah. it's it's a really important skill. 
I'm glad you mentioned that actually because that was one of my questions which you've answered so well in terms of accessibility and reaching those who are maybe um, have stigma in terms of wanting to reach support or lack awareness but obviously you, you've answered that very well in terms of how you go about doing that. One of the things I wanted to also ask before we begin to close out the show um, can you share some success stories of people that you've worked with who have you know had mental health issues or particular mm. um, battles of mental health and have gone on to do some great things. Yeah. Well, what a great story. You know, I, I think I wish now working in mental health, I see it all the time, George. I see incredible people of courage who have recovered and made a massive contribution. I mean, I will just talk about our, our head of research at the foundation is a guy who, who is uh, very well respected, has a PhD, Dr. David Krepas Keys, and when he was in his early 20s, he got a diagnosis of uh, schizophrenia and was in a psychiatric ward and um, was told basically, or, you know, the thing, the assumption was that's, that's you on the, on the sort of rubbish heap yeah. of humanity now. All you've yeah. got to do is live out with this, with this illness. And he, he had a, a doctor who didn't believe that and said, you can make a contribution, David, you, you've got a lot to offer, who didn't define him by that specific episode of mental Ill health. And we do a lot, you know, we're, we're so passionate about making people believe that experiencing mental ill health, mental struggles, it, it does not disqualify you, right? It qualifies Absolutely. you to do what you're doing with humanity and empathy mm. because your experience is relevant to so many people. And the one thing I would say is that, you know, we have to let people know that they are, they're not on their own. And, yeah. um, and, and so David's gone on to have an incredible career um, over 25, 30 years as one of the leading academics on, on mental health and, um, and manages his, his mental health in the workplace in a fantastic way. And, and, um, you know, has, has um, married and, um had a really fulfilling and, and made a really important contribution so we yep. need to tell these stories um that there is there is light at the end of the tunnel and at the end of the tunnel and recovery is is not just possible but um yeah you know it, it, well it's 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 attainable yeah absolutely um again lastly before we before we close out for people who are watching it watching listening and are probably thinking I'm one of those people that needs help but for different reasons are afraid to seek the help um what would be your message to those people yeah i mean the the statistics are stark it it's it, yeah. it's similar to in terms of cancer like all of the outcomes are worse um and in what we find it particularly for men is that mm -hmm. the distress has to go somewhere the trauma has to go somewhere. The emotions have to go somewhere. And oftentimes we yeah. find that comes out in anger, sometimes in violence. Um, and and so it's not a decision about, about whether or not you deal with what you're feeling. It's going to come out. It's going to impact. It's just whether or not you deal with that in a healthy way or an unhealthy way. That's the only choice. It's going to have an impact. You can't hide it. It's got to go somewhere. It's real. So it's just a question of whether or not you turn towards it Mm. and have a plan for managing naming the first thing is to name it the first thing is to name i'm actually struggling with feelings of anxiety or i'm, I'm actually struggling with um not being able to um regulate my sense of ang uh, a sense of anger and it's damaging me in these ways um and so mm. i would say to people there are there is nothing to fear and i would wager if you're worried about whether you're making too big a deal of it, I would wager on the fact that most people underestimate the impact of poor mental health on their lives. And, um, you know, my first port of call would be finding someone that you trust. If you can't find someone that you, you can trust, seek out role models who have told their story and how that they have gone about it and give you that confidence. And then are you know, I would seek a, you know, seek a professional help um, to, for a second opinion. You're just asking the question. This yeah. is my experience and I need to get some perspective on where this lies in terms of the support that might be available or might be needed. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to leave everyone with some stats that I found from uh, Gov UK. 
um, as of earlier today, uh, being the 17th of May. Uh, according to Gov UK, between November 2022 and January 2024, the following findings about suicide in the UK are true. For persons and males of the age groups between 10 to 24 and 45 to 64, the rate recorded in January as of 2024 is the highest in the reporting period. And it was significantly higher for persons and males uh, than December 2023, the month prior. And out of 4,931 deaths, this number really, really, really shocks me, to be fair. 73% were males and 26 were female. Um, and 37.9% of those were aged 25 to 44 and mm. 45 to 64. That isn't to scare anyone or to, you know, raid the competition about many. It's not about that at all. It's just to, to raise awareness because that is a incredibly high number we mentioned men in particular that's an incredibly high rate 73 percent of those deaths um males and 26 um females so i say all that to say um men women anyone watching it's really okay it's 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 okay to not be okay and as marcus said there are ways in which you can begin the process of almost getting to the bottom of what it is that's causing these feelings and, and mm -hmm. seeking help and looking for idols who have mm -hmm. done the same thing and, and are mm -hmm. able to live their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and do not be afraid to reach out. I mean, at the end of this show, if anything we've discussed affects you personally, be it suicide or death or cancer, um, there will be descriptions of where you can find help, um, both in the social media descriptions and captions and on the descriptions on YouTube as well. Um, and of course, the Mental Health Foundation always willing to help as well as places like the Samaritans as well. So please don't feel like you're alone. Um, everyone deals with mental health in different ways, shapes and forms. And we are only human. We are only human. Um, so Mark, I want to thank you once again for coming on the show and sharing your story with me. Um, very, very brave of you to do that. And I really do appreciate it. And I know this will be great for people to watch and listen back to. Um, do you have any last words? Oh, I loved it, George. I mean, I, I think you've just summarized it. But, um, you know, I'd say like, you know, we are at this tipping point where we are much more aware of mental health, but we've got to develop the skills and tools. And there is one quality that's required for that above all others. And that's that is one around courage. It's like turn and face the pain. And, you know, that will, if you can turn and face it and then develop a plan you're going to be better off and that's really uh the challenge that we face is how do we help support each other to do that and with that i have been george from george on sports here with the chief executive of the mental health foundation mark Rowland, uh on this special week of mental health mental health awareness week and um, we will see you on the next episode but please both men women and anyone that needs to help find the courage to seek the help you will not regret see you on the next episode